So we're recording now, and I am really excited to introduce our speaker today, Patrick Dollar, Processing Archivist from SKUA, and he's going to be talking to us about archives space. Um, so I'm going to just turn it over to Patrick, but I'll be keeping an eye on that chat if you need anything. Thanks, Jenny. That was really, really sweet and awesome. And thank you for um, asking me to participate in the ULVLC. It has been really important to me. So I have been to a lot of sessions. Um, it's been a nice way to connect to folks and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, <clears throat> can everyone hear me okay? I'm a little, always a little worried about it that my mic is covered up. Okay. Um, cool. I'm gonna be talking about archive space, um, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. I'm gonna try not to check the chat again because I just advanced the slide when I didn't really want it to. Um, but Jenny assured me that y'all would cut me some slack um, since this is a ULVLC presentation. <clears throat> so I'm the systems administrator for special collections um, for archive space. And in case y'all don't know, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what archive space is our migration to archive space from our previous um, archival information management system, which was Archon, um, ways that we're using archive space, um, new ways. And then uh, Jenny suggested it might be helpful to do a little walkthrough. So I'm gonna actually show you um, how to use the public <coughs> user interface and to do a couple of test searches with y'all. Um, bearing in mind that if I will do suggestions, if y'all have suggestions, but that I haven't tested all of the um, possible searches. No, I can't advance my slide. There we go. Um, so before we get to that, actually, um, Archive Space, I will just tell you, is our um, information management system that holds our finding aids, our accession records, pretty much all of the data that we co collect and create connected to and describing our collections. So it's a really great system. Um, it's sort of a union of all the other archival management systems that came before it, Archon and Archive, Archivist Toolkit in particular. Um, and it, like I said, supports all, pretty much all of the functions throughout a collection's lifecycle from ingest, when we would create an accession record saying that we received this collection, the date, the donor, um, and more administrative information like that, all the way to the creation of the finding aid, which would describe the collection and um, connect to <clears throat> bibliographic terms, subject terms, agent records that would make the collection more discoverable to the end user. And that's ultimately the piece that the user would be looking at um, is the finding aid or those other published records. Although we do also publish the accession records um, <clears throat> unless there's something particularly sensitive that um, we're not making the collection available yet. So a little bit of background of Archon to Archive Space. Archon was our um, previous information management system. Y'all have probably seen it. Um, it's no longer um, live. We're not using Archon anymore, but it was our management system for quite a few years. I don't really know when we started with that, before, before I came, it was in existence in SCUA. <clears throat> but um, we had been looking at archive space since about 2013 to see what other institutions were adopting it and how their experiences were going with the tool. And we really just wanted to let the tool develop to um, become more advanced and to, to be more secure in our transition to this new system. We got a big push in that regard because Archon was no longer being supported or updated back in 2017, 18. They announced that they would no longer be um, updating Archon. And our instance has already had already been having some issues anyway because it was running on um, a Windows environment and not its sort of native Linux. <clears throat> so all of that pushed us to really um, begin talking more with Atlas. Y'all are probably very familiar with Atlas. They have other um, library systems and, and um, software that they offer. <clears throat> but they had just begun hosting Archive Space in 2018. 
and we began talking with them and working through some contract issues. I wasn't involved with that. That was pretty much all Jennifer, Mosco, and Keith, who have now both gone. Um, but uh, once we were comfortable with that, we began the process of the migration, mainly because we felt that it would the system would ultimately be a more secure system, um, be more reliable, would have a better user interface. And would really, um, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but it would really allow us to rethink our collection management because archive space has so many different functions, functions that go well beyond what Archon offered. And we'll, we'll talk about those in a bit. <clears throat> but with that, we began some of the pre-migration work, which was somewhat intensive. Um, first off, we established a timeline we began the pre-migration in about February of 2018 and had hoped to do the migration before Jennifer Motzko left, um, which was in July 2018. <coughs> Excuse me. I do not have the coronavirus. If I cough, I sometimes get a nervous cough when I, when I talk for a long time. But um, the test instance of archive space, Atlas was kind enough to set us up with that test instance so that we could pull out our archi Archon data and upload it into this test instance of arch archive space to then mitigate any migration errors that we would encounter when we did the final migration. So we worked with Atlas developers to work through some top container issues. So top containers are the fancy words that um, archive space gives to basically the highest level container that holds an item. Typically in our case, that's just a box. But it can refer to a box that has boxes inside of it. It's a sort of a strange vocabulary, but that's all that that means. Um, we also noticed a lot of special character issues, especially with the foreign language materials um, in the cello music collections. Um, location issues were another thing that we tried to change in Archon before the final migration because SCUA had input data in a lot of different ways in the location field. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that in a minute too, because we did not manage to fix all of those issues. But um, it was really great that Atlas did so much pre-migration work for us. I think that it would have made the cleanup much more painful if we hadn't done some of that pre-migration work to mitigate some of these issues. They still ended up being issues, but they, I think that they, they weren't as, um, prevalent as they might have been. So the final Archon instance, which Brown was kind enough to um, export for us, we sent to Alice and they imported an archive space in July 2018. And then in November 2018, we hired um, a library technician for a six month position for cleanup. It's funny that I say that because it ended up being um, longer than that. Um, but y'all may have met Finley uh, Trent Turner while she was um, at the library. Oh, and I should note that, that is, this presentation, um, this initial part about the migration, this is part of a presentation that Finley and David Glenn and I gave at SNCA um, in 2018. Um, no, 2019, I, uh, my timelines. <clears throat> so kudos to them. Um, Finley was instrumental in our migration um, so much, I can't, give her enough props for that. So post-migration, the cleanup really began and we began moving by collection area. Uh, we had a shortened timeline, unfortunately, due to campus ITS. Campus ITS had concerns about the vulnerabilities of Archon, um, some things that could be exploited. So we took down the public instance of Archon for anyone outside of the campus domain I mean, so you can still access Archon if you were on campus, but if you were off campus, you had to go to Archive Space. So we pushed the public instance of Archive Space live much earlier than we really anticipated. So um, I created a special landing page for our finding aids that y'all probably saw that linked, that explained the differences in access and linked out to both Archon and Archive Space and um, just mentioned to people that we were still doing the cleanup and to, to bear with us while we um, worked on the data. <clears throat> we also noticed lots of surprises. Um, and that's why I put in Ewan McGregor because uh, 
sometimes the archives were incomplete and that was sort of upsetting and, and a new thing. Pop containers, I pointed out um, in particular because that is one of our biggest areas that we had issues with. So missing items. Um, this is a screenshot from Archon. This is how the finding aid should look. It gives you the box and all of the items um, linked to their cabinets. And this is how it imported into archive space. <clears throat> that series is there, but the individual items did not come through. Um, you can see that, unfortunately. Pop container issues. Um, I mentioned that we, <laughs> needless to say, this is wrong. I mentioned that we did input um, data in a variety of different ways. So in Archon, all, a way that we had pretty commonly input data was to just say all, meaning all of the boxes, and then put the date, the range where the boxes started. Um, that is not the way that Arch Archive Space treats pop containers. So we had to go back and fix that. The, this all was applied, um, the only box applied to um, this collection, and it was applied to the collection level, which Atlas strongly encouraged us not to do. They encouraged us to <coughs> apply the boxes at the um, item level, the folder level, um, because of cleanup that we may have to do later if boxes shifted. Um, just for the way that they typically recommend their institutions to input the top containers. <clears throat> so a little bit about the workflow behind the um, cleanup. Finley initially created a document that looked just like this. It was called Archive Space Errors and Edits, and it was going to be one document where we tracked all of the issues, <clears throat> the date that we discovered it, if it was resolved, um, et cetera, et cetera. That was a really great idea, but there were so many issues and errors that we decided that, that was not going to work. So um, I had Finley create different documents on um, Google Drive for each of the different collection areas. So there was one for manuscripts, for university archives, women veterans, and um, special collections. <clears throat> And that would allow Finley to share that with the collection area specialist, so Bethann, Aaron, et cetera, and um, <clears throat> have them really work collaboratively and closely with her as she did the cleanup, because they would know the answers to questions that I wouldn't know. Um, I was sort of supervising the, the cleanup and supervising Finley, but I did not know the answers to a lot of specific collection area questions. And it just allowed us to split it up a little bit more. This one document was going to get really unwieldy really quickly. So I think that was a good, a good move. And this is an example of what the, the University Archives locations document sort of looked like. And so we just took them pretty much one by one, each collection one by one, and Finley would check to make sure all the boxes were where they were supposed to be. We would update the, the physical locations, which became a really big issue um, that I mentioned with the top containers and the way we input location data. Um, and then she, you can also note that she notes, um, you can note that she notes uh, errors that she's encountering, like in the faculty council, general faculty records, their duplicate top containers. So that, that method was a, a lot better, and I actually still refer to these um, documents that she created once in a while to make sure, like, did we fix this? Is this is this the way this is supposed to be? Um, it, it was a great, a great thing that she did. It was a lot of work. But our biggest uh, goal was really to just ensure this consistency in metadata because we all had different metadata input methods. Even if our finding aids were still DAX compliant, there's still uh, different ways to input data. <clears throat> And the migration just caused some data to be jumbled around and put into the wrong field. Dates were a big one. Dates were a really big one. So the way that the migration happened, the dates weren't placed into the discrete number fields that would be searchable by the system if we were filtering on dates. They were put into a general like expression field that was open text 
um, which still displayed properly, but wouldn't allow us to have that robust search by date that we really wanted. So Finley did go back and change changed a lot of dates. Uh, another big wrinkle during the cleanup that impacted everyone's workflow, not just Finley's and mine, um, new data entry was temporarily halted. And I say temporarily, but I know that the folks from SCUA would say it was a year, it was a whole year. It was a long time. Um, it was longer than we had anticipated it would be. So we had to ask everybody in SCUA to keep track of all of their future um, data that they needed to put in, their finding aids, their accession records to enter once um, archive space, the cleanup was done because Keith didn't, Keith and I didn't really want people to be updating data as Finley cleaned it up just so we wouldn't get lost in where the cleanup had happened and where it hadn't. I have to include an image of the public interface because I think it looks pretty. Um, it's the one positive after I talked about sort of the issues of migration. And we're going to see it again in action and we'll probably see the Hansen collection because of course I love the Hansen collection. i be grateful it's not the Cobalt collection that I'm highlighting. Oh, but um, before I get to that, uh, you can see on the right the collection organization. That's probably what we'll be talking about the most. Um, let me see if I can respond to a chat and somebody had just a happy face. Yep, yep, Kathleen, Kathleen. And John, Archon, it was good. It was good for its time, but we have moved into the, the wonderful future of archive space. Um, so moving away from the migration, we have fully implemented archive space. We are gangbusters with archive space now. Everyone in the department is totally on board and loves it, or they're at least tolerating it for my sake. Um, <laughs> we had an idea, Kathleen um, mentioned and asked me if, if there was a way that we could use archive space for our rare book collections. Carolyn, um, who is awesome, has, provided me with this image from the paper-based system that we had used, which was very long established. And we were all you know, familiar with that system. We had student workers who were trained on that system. Um, so the big question is why would, why would you change? Well, um, I think the big driver was a question of if we could save any time, if archive space would allow us to automate any aspect of this paper-based system, which was um, slightly time-consuming, to a system that we could make move more quickly. Um, because archive space does has, have such robust capabilities. So Kathleen came into my office and asked me that, and I said, well, maybe. Um, I think so, but let me poke around. So we entered the investigative phase, um, which, you know, could we even do it? Um, I posted in a Google group that the Atlas folks love to point me towards to ask other people about their experiences. Um, <clears throat> that was very helpful. Um, it was helpful mostly to see that no one was really doing what we wanted it to do. They were, they were inputting rare books information into archive space, but typically treating them more like a discrete collection and describing them like they were in a finding aid. It still had some bibliographic data, some cataloging data, but it did not really match that, um, I was trying to go back, that paper record that you can see right there. It didn't really capture all of the information that we needed it to capture. So I kept thinking, I went and talked with our awesome cataloguers over in technical services. I talked with um, Callie and Marcy in particular, um, and they walked me through the different types of records that they had that we could potentially export and I could import into Archive Space. Archive Space happily has a function that will allow for a MARC XML import. Um, that was what I thought we would end up using um, because it would be, you know, one-to-one -one, pretty much that does not turn out to be the case, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, I also reached out to Atlas staff just to see what their opinion was of the matter. Um, they 
admitted that the mark xml um, option may not be the best that they it has bugs and that people have complained about its capabilities in all the tests i ran it seemed to do fine it just didn't capture all of the data that we needed it to capture and then i just got to experiment which was fun it was so much fun i i uh if you can't tell really do like archive space um and had a good time just trying to massage the data and to get it to do and to massage a system to get it to do what we wanted to do. And that's sort of been our experience more broadly with archive space. Um, John can attest to that. Um, we did, and he did, um, lots of help helping me and massaging the data to get um, imports for our, our, our uh, resource records or our finding aids were up and running. Um, so it's sort of been an iterative, iterative process throughout all of our archive space you know, projects that we're doing. And really, it was technical services to the rescue. Um, this is an example of a record that they exported from me, a CSV file, because Archive Space um, definitely has that capability to import a CSV file. And we thought that would be a better option when the XML sort of didn't seem like it would be working out. <clears throat> I cannot for the life of me remember the uh, uh, correlations between the cataloging numbers and what the field is. I apologize. I had to make myself a cheat sheet for it because I only took one cataloging, not even a full course. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. Um, so cataloging kindly exported this for me from uh, earlier in the year, I think up in January. It was an accession that they'd gotten from Carolyn. And um, I was testing with, with, with files that looked a lot like this. Um, and I had to massage it into the import uh, spreadsheet that Atlas had, that Atlas uses for archive space to import. And again, um, these aren't the same records because I, I didn't keep that. I apologize that there's not a consistency where you can see, but accession title, you know, that mapped the 245 field. I just had to make sure each of the cataloging fields were mapped to the correct archive space field which did um, was not something I did on my own. I did a lot of talking with Carolyn. Carolyn and Callie both were really helpful in helping me decide where they wanted the fields to be, where they would fit the best, and what type of fields we would need to request from Atlas that weren't an out-of-the-box feature. So there are some user-defined fields. I don't know, I guess you can see my pointer right here. Um, these we had to um, talk with Atlas to put in our own sort of custom user defined text. <clears throat> and we'll see that um, in just a second. But um, it was it was interesting. It could be frustrating at times to do this iterative testing, but I typically worked with one or two books at a time. I made sure that they went in. I looked at them with Carolyn. Carolyn told me what it was doing that she liked and what she it was doing that she didn't like and we went back to talk with cataloging we went back to talk with alice it was really fun uh, from my end carolyn was probably sick of it by the time we were done but um like i said I, it was sort of like a mystery or solving a puzzle um and then then it worked and i heard victory fanfare and i was very excited and um, I created a rare book repository. That's another sort of interesting piece about archive space. You have the ability to create different repositories within your own instance of archive space. So we have the main one, which is where all of our finding aids are held, which is the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives. There's a staging repository that's just sort of our testing ground. And then we have a rare books repository that I created that will only house these rare book collections that we're importing, these items that we're importing, just so it wouldn't overload the main system. And really because it's for internal use only, it's not for external use at all. <clears throat> so we updated those archive space functions that I mentioned, those user defined fields, and we really fully implemented it. I was looking back at my emails, I think right at the end or maybe the middle of February, Carolyn can correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I checked and so far we've uploaded 307 book records, which is really awesome. And um, I think I have an example on the next page. I do. 
this is an example of how the rare book will look once it's imported in archive space. We have imported them as accessions. Um, that was the easiest way to get all of the, uh, Atlas actually helped me reach that conclusion. It was the easiest way to get all of the information that we wanted and have that flexibility. So provenance, general note, all of that is an out of the box feature of archive space. Where it gets uh, more interesting and where we had to do a lot more individual work is with the um, user defined fields that I have down here at the bottom. So all of these rare book succession only fields are the fields that we created and that um, Carolyn pretty much used the, the paper card and told me what she needed and we created a field for it. And it's really um, working well so far. The source, that was how we got around being able to tie all of the collections to together. So the home economics pamphlet we created as an agent record. That, would normally be like a person or an entity in archive space. Like if you look at a finding aid, it would be Dr. Hansen or Howard Coble or Charles McKeever. But we decided to link all the collections to make them as agents. So home economics pamphlets, special collections, general, women's detective fiction. Each of those were their own agents so that all of the materials that we uploaded would be tied to that same agent and we could then browse the collections um, based on the agent record by the collection. So this is what you would get if you clicked on that uh, home economics pamphlet agent. You get a breakdown of all the different accessions that we've uploaded um, use under that, that agent and you can sort, which is another piece that Carolyn was really, um, really needed and, and wanted because it would replicate the paper shelf list and the shelf, you know, listing itself. Um, so it looks like there might be something slightly squirrely going on right here with the fish and shellfish coming first, but um, you can see that it then you can, I sorted by identifier is what I tried to do, but you could do it by a title, um, however you wanted to sort it pretty much from the screen. So the big takeaways um, before we get to the fun uh, interactive or at least searching exercise, uh, migration takeaways, consistency was really our watchword and our goal throughout the migration. We tried to solicit collaboration input as much as we could throughout the process because it's really hard to think through um, some of these issues for areas that you're not as familiar with or with decisions that would impact a larger group. So we really tried to do that as much as we could. Migrating is awesome because it allows you to start over and rethink things um, to, to develop new practices and to create best practices. And last but not least, uh, migrating is really hard. Um, David, that was sort of our co-takeaway when David and I and Finley did this presentation at SNCO because David was talking about the Island Dora migration. It's just hard. Um, it's hard to corral that much data, to correct that much data, to make sure everything is working smoothly. More generally, my fun archive space takeaways are new systems take time to get used to. And I saw that, Sean. It, it is your repository. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, it, is, it is now your repository. Um, because it's, it's fun to innovate new ways to use the system. Um, that's my favorite, favorite thing about it. Is it like the migration takeaway? It allows you to go, go back and try new things and shake up old ways of doing things and maybe even find a new way to do something like we did with the rare books and really my my biggie is don't don't be afraid to ask for help because you know i i could have spun my wheels on a lot of different things about archive space but i reached out to atlas to others in the field who are using archive space and they were really helpful in not usually telling me the answer but pointing me in the right direction it, or saying, here are a bunch of different options. Choose which one will work best for you. So it's really helpful to use the resources that you have available. Okay, so now you're like, well, that was that was exciting, <laughs> but, but how do I actually use this? 
I thought we would go on an adventure. And I will try not to search for Howard Coble. But I, I figured we would do a test search or two. <laughs> um, I have one, a couple in mind, so I'll start with that. And then if you have one that you would really like to see, we can do that because I have plenty of time for that. Um, the one that I thought of, this should, this should look really familiar. Uh, hopefully you have been to the public interface of archive space. If not, why don't we, why don't I should show, I know you know how to get there. This is sort of patronizing now that I'm doing it. Um, finding aids. <laughs> there you are. Boom. Um, so from here, I would just use the basic search box to start with and then you can filter it down. I think it's really helpful to do it in that way. So the one that I thought of first was McKeever. So let's just do a basic search. A student might do a search for McKeever and be a tiny bit overwhelmed when they see 383 records. Um, I think a frustrating thing, an awesome thing, but it can be frustrating thing about archive space is that it will search all the objects and collections at once. So it's sort of like a full text search. It will search everything and it will return all of those results. So you have to do a little digging or do some strategies. So you could get to the collection, if you were looking for the finding aid itself, you could get to the collection level record by following the person record. But the easiest way is really to go over onto the right and you can use all of these awesome filters that Archive Space has. You could even filter by subject heading. But we want to see the collection level, so we're going to hit collection. There's still 21 of those, but happily, Charles Duncan McKeever records, which is the one we wanted, is first. So I'm going to follow that and show you a little bit more about um, the collection level record. So from here, um, you get all the normal notes and information that you would get from Archon, the same, same things. Conditions governing access, biographical historical information, et cetera. And then down below, um, Archive Space is awesome in that it will link a bit more um, easily to digital objects. It'll take you straight there. There is a way to make it display images, but we haven't really worked that out yet. Um, again, that was a function of Archon as well, but it just is a little more seamless within archive space itself. But the part that I think is the coolest um, is this collection organization bar here on the right. So students are used to doing control F, to searching, to um, not having to dig through and wade through a bunch of records. So I don't know how useful it'll be for McKeever because I didn't do a test, but let's search for the students building now that I see it. To say they were looking for something about the students building, they could type that in over here on the collection organization side and search and see that there's a result or see that there's not a result. Um, you could also filter by year, which I hope all the dates on this have been corrected. So let's do 1903 to 1903 and see what comes back. Okay. Yeah, still not great because you're still getting, I mean, it's accurate. You're still, those are still fall within that date range, but um, things are restricted by date, which I think is a, an awesome, awesome feature. Um, Archon, again, you would have to, um, especially with the larger collections, really just sort of scroll through the entire thing or do control F. Um, but I think the search is uh, a great feature that Archive Space offers. Questions so far? I know it's very exciting. I haven't seen questions come in in the chat, but if anybody has questions, okay, please I'll throw keep, them in there. Yeah, do it. I'll keep I'll keep going, and if you think of the question, hopefully I can answer it. Um, let's go backwards to look at the Hanson collection, as I promised. So again, um, it's not the first thing, which can be frustrating, I think, for folks. But I would recommend, let's go, no, let's go through the person this time. Let's click on Dr. Hansen's name. And it'll show you what collections or records he's tied to. 
let's pull up his finding aid. So again, say we wanted to look for a specific play. If we had if Dr. Hansen, which is this is very possible, had assigned X bad boy to the students, let's see if they could just search the collection level record and see if they had, oh, we do have stuff, which I knew. <laughs> I shouldn't act surprised. So we have posters. Um, see, that's where it gets a little less accurate. It's still searching boy, it's doing both. So you would probably want to tell the student to put the quotations around text bad boy. I believe that works, it should work. Yep. So I really love that about archive space as well. It sort of functions like you would expect or just a function unlike some other systems that I've seen. Going backwards though, if you just knew that you were looking for something related to Hamlet, which is very possible. A student could be like, I just want to see Hamlet things. Do you have things about Hamlet? Again, they may not immediately see what they want to see because we do have folks with that name, Hamlet. But I know that Dr. Hansen has Hamlet materials, at least. We have a couple of different collections. We also have this Jane Kimmel Theater collection with a Laurence Olivier Hamlet playbill in it. Pretty cool. Um, so again, it'll full text. That, that is full text searching the entire finding aid and pulling out an individual item and telling you this is where it is. It's in series nine, series one, file folder two, and it's a poster. Um, so you could pretty easily request that um, or let us know, hey, a student is coming up to look for that. Or you could help the student point them to it, how to find it. I love archive space. I will quit gushing. Um, you can browse as well up in digital material. Um, again, you can't really see the image, unfortunately. We need to work on that, but it'll link you out to all of the various digital records that we have, whether that's in content DM, um, BDRM, et cetera. Archive it. I think that's the other one we link to most often. You can browse by subjects. Um, process material are our accession records, so things that we haven't actually processed yet. Um, and then the record groups, I don't know how familiar y'all are with that, but that was also a thing in Archon that you could browse by um, the, the record group as well. So if you knew you only wanted to see collections in the um, Bryan School of Business, you could then browse that way and find the finding aids. If that all makes sense. And gave you at least a trick or two to search archive space. It's, I think it's a little more intuitive than Archon. I had trouble finding things in Archon. That, that is a future tattoo idea, Sean. I'm getting it, I'm gonna get it. Okay. I, can I ask a question, Patrick? Yeah. So is this something that y'all tend to teach in in classes like when undergrad or grad classes come in do you teach students how to use this or is this more for working like directly with researchers? No, we actually do usually teach um, how to use archive space because it's really I mean it's so key to finding our collections. It is usually part of our instruction when folks come in to the library we talk about how you get to our finding aids, how you search archive space, how you search within a finding aid. Yeah, that's usually included. The back end, the back end staff interface, no, um, we will reserve that for the student workers. Not even every student worker is creating a finding aid, most of them. That's a good question. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Yeah, it's time. And if you do have a question at this point, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to ask it. You don't have to use the chat exclusively. 
All right, well, I see people saying thanks and great job. And that's my cue to make sure that I put the assessment form in the chat. Oops, too many windows open. Okay, link in that assessment form, I really appreciate it. If you would fill that out for me, it's very quick and easy. Um, and it helps us a lot as we are thinking about uh, future sessions and what works and what doesn't. Um, I'm seeing no questions, even as I'm sort of stalling here. <laughs> questions, questions. Um, I want to thank you so much, Patrick. I think that was really interesting, and I think uh, it's something that I want to talk to my interns about in the fall. I think that Kathleen might talk about it when she does a sort of SCUA intro for them. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I see the interns getting, uh, <laughs> great. Um, I see the interns getting a little panicky when they get a question about <laughs> the collections topic. If it's after five, they're kind of, I mean, obviously not right now. I don't see the interns at all, but, um, in a situation, uh, where the, someone would be like, Hey, can you tell me about this building on campus or whatever? And they just sort of have that. Uh, deer in the headlights kind of look. So definitely want to make sure that they play around with this. So I may give them some kind of assignment when things get a little more back to normal. Well, still don't see any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>